We had a workshop in the library on tarot that ended just about five minutes ago, and we keep pushing the tarot workshops earlier and earlier in the day so that we're sure they won't conflict with the timing of the lecture, but we started this one at 3.30 and it went on for four hours. It was supposed to be about 90 minutes, but uh, these things take on a, a life of their own. So, sorry, I'm dressed so casual, I didn't have time to get ready. I was going to wear my Blue Oyster Cult t-shirt, but it was just <laughs> that kind of day, so Sabbath will have to do. Um, this is a very special night because it, it represents the launch of the new Manley Hall book, The Secret History of America. And it's an interesting trajectory that's behind Manley's work right now in the 21st century. When he died in 1990, it was a very difficult time for Manley. He feared that his work would be forgotten. He was worried that the books that he had written and the lectures that he had delivered over the course of decades and decades and the hundreds of articles and essays would just be forgotten by time. There was a new digital culture that was just dawning and he didn't feel like he was any part of it. And to some extent, quite frankly, he was taken advantage of by people at that time in his life. A lot of you are aware there was a great controversy around the circumstances surrounding Manley's death. There were a couple of con artists who kind of got their talons in him and they sang him a beautiful song about how they were going to re-release his work over the dawning internet and they were going to broadcast his lectures through satellite technology and so on. And he was taken in by all this to the point where even just a few days before his death, he had signed over his will under circumstances that were subject to a great deal of questioning to one of these figures who had found their way into his life and a federal court judge later overturned the will and said that the circumstances didn't pass any reasonable person's sniff test. And actually for a while, as some of you may be aware, the LAPD even had an open uh, file on Manley's death investigating the question of whether there was foul play involved. And that file is now closed. And I don't think there was foul, foul play involved, but there were circumstances that surrounded his death that were disturbing. And part of these circumstances uh, grew his, his sense of personal vulnerability at that time in life grew out of his fear that the work that he had achieved and compiled over the course of an extraordinary lifetime would be forgotten. And I think tonight, in a sense, can almost be a celebration that not only is Manley's work not forgotten, but I feel certain that due to the popularity of the reader's edition of The Secret Teachings of All Ages, the new publication of Secret History of America, the events that are going on at PRS in Shore, that Manley is being more widely read uh, today uh, in the opening decades of the 21st century than he was during his lifetime. And his work is out digitally and in book form, and there are new people coming to it. And this new book is just going to, I think, expose a whole new generation of readers to work by a man who, who feared that, that he would die and be forgotten. But he has not been forgotten because the questions that he posed were just indestructible questions. He affirmed an ideal for people that history is not just a linear timeline and a march of events and dates and names, but history is a kind of living thing that if looked at in the right way becomes a story of every individual's wish to relate to some sort of higher, unknown, not always visible forces in life. 
that the history of individuals, of civilizations, of developments in technology, of advances in the capacity of the individual to live out his or her fullest potential goes hand in hand with the spiritual search, with the search for the extra physical, with the search for the existence of primeval principles within the communities and the societies that we live in and within the story of our own lives. The questions that motivated Manly P. Hall are indestructible questions. And the questions that motivate you all here tonight are indestructible questions. And these things can never be forgotten. And Manly has not been forgotten. And it gives me the greatest joy that not only is his work being read by larger and larger numbers of people, but even obscure corners of his work that he thought were going to be forgotten, lectures that he gave that were later transcribed, essays that he wrote, articles that he wrote back in the 1920s, 1930s for esoteric and occult journals that he published are now reaching a whole new audience, a whole new constituency. And many of these things can be found as far as they pertain to American history in the secret history of America. Manley had a kind of thesis about American history, which is very, very important to understand. I call it the secret society thesis, and it runs throughout his work, and it was this. His contention was that primeval wisdom was preserved within small communities of people, small groups, and organizations that are sometimes thought of as being secret, like Freemasonry or Rosicrucianism. And he believed that these, these groups, these kind of communities of search, were the retention and the repository of wisdom that had been part of the quest to translate unknown principles into symbols. Symbols that could be looked upon and could remind individuals of the permanence of life in ways that go beyond the physical. And the centerpiece, the centerpiece of the mission of the secret society was the protection of the individual search for meaning, the protection of the individual search for meaning. That's the most vital principle of life. With it, everything becomes possible. Without it, everything is meaningless. And I think that that is embodied in the very beautiful, very mysterious symbol of the Iron Pyramid that exists today on the back of our dollar bill. You see a pyramid, sort of a, a, a work of temporal worldliness, capped by the all-seeing eye of providence. And the eye of providence is not part of the pyramid. It hovers just above the pyramid. And the suggestion is that the work of men and women is incomplete without a sense of the higher, without a sense of the ineffable. And it's surrounded by the Latin maxim, annuit septus noos ordo seclorum, which can be roughly translated as God smiles on our new order of the ages. People hear the term new order nowadays, and thanks to late night radio and stuff that goes on on the internet, they think it's this fearsome phrase. It, to me, it's a beautiful phrase. It's a beautiful phrase. The symbol of the Iron Pyramid on the back of our dollar bill, it's not a leaf directly out of Freemasonry, but I think it was very closely inspired by Freemasonry. It was a symbol, as you can read about in Secret History of America, that was devised very, very early in the nation's history. On July 4th, 1776, appropriately enough, the newly founded Continental Congress formed a subcommittee. And this subcommittee, which was chaired by Benjamin Franklin, himself a Freemason, was charged with designing the seal of the Republic. And it took about four years until they settled upon a final design. 
and that final design was on its, its obverse side, its front facing, its public facing side, the familiar American eagle with arrows clutched in one claw and olive branches of peace clutched in another claw. But the obverse, the reverse symbol, the reverse symbol was the more mysterious, more esoteric eye and pyramid surrounded by that beautiful Latin maxim. And for many years, most Americans were unfamiliar with the reverse side. It was used as a seal for government business. It was used as a diplomatic imprimatur, but it wasn't widely known to the public. And it was actually only in the year 1935 that it got placed on the back of our currency. And that was thanks to two Freemasons who were then in the White House, Franklin Roosevelt and his Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, who actually later became his second vice president. He was followed by the better known Harry Truman. But Wallace was considered an extraordinary figure during the 1930s. And in many respects, Wallace was regarded as the kind of national philosopher of the New Deal. And Wallace was a man of real occult passions. He was a Freemason. He was a theosophist. He read very deeply into Tibetan Buddhism at a time when most Americans had barely even heard of Buddhism. He was very interested in astrology. And when Wallace sort of came onto Roosevelt's radar, he was very kind of turned on by the idea of having this man in his administration first as Secretary of Agriculture, because Wallace's father had been the Secretary of Agriculture in the administration of Warren Harding. And Wallace was also a Republican. He came from a long line of Republicans. And Roosevelt felt that it would add some, some gravitas to his administration to have a Republican voice in it. Even though he had been elected on a very liberal plank, he liked the idea of having a Republican who was a, who, who, a, a Secretary of Agriculture who was a Republican who came from a, a long line of Republicans. At the time, Wallace was the editor of a magazine in Iowa called Wallace's Farmer, which had been founded by his grandfather. And Wallace's Farmer was an agricultural journal, which among other things used astrology to advise farmers on planting cycles and was a very, in its own way, a very wide ranging magazine. And at that time, Wallace himself was very, very deeply ensconced in different esoteric studies. He was interested in reincarnation. He was interested in Native American mysticism. He wore vestments and was an official within an organization called the Liberal Catholic Church, which was a branch of the Theosophical Movement. He was very interested in mind metaphysics, in New Thought. One of the books that he was most turned on by was a book called In Tune with the Infinite, by a writer named Ralph Waldo Trine. It's not a widely read book today, but it was a very, very popular book written almost half a century before Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking, which kind of took the whole mind causation philosophy and reprocessed it through scriptural language so that, so that the church going public could be comfortable with it. But Ralph Waldo Trine's book, In Tune with the Infinite, which in its day was a big bestseller, it came out in 1899, was a very, very mystical book, a very radically ecumenical book. And this was a book toward which Wallace had gravitated when he was a kid. And there were people who lined up to tell Roosevelt, you can't name this guy as your secretary of agriculture. He's just too weird. He's He's a mystic, he's an occultist, he's going to be a really strange presence in the White House. And Roosevelt snapped back at one detractor, Jim Farley, who was the Postmaster General, and said, he's not a mystic, he's a digger, he's a thinker, he'll help the people think. Now, can you imagine today a US president saying, I want this guy for my Secretary of Agriculture because he'll help the people think. You know, that's not something that you could imagine 
you know, erupting from the mouth of a president today, is it? Um, no, but, but Roosevelt uh, stood by him and he brought Wallace into the White House. And Wallace, almost overnight, became a very popular figure. He had the ability to speak to and to inspire very diffuse constituencies. He was a great Secretary of Agriculture. He probably saved thousands upon thousands of family farms during the Great Depression because he was a scientific agriculturalist and he was one of the first people in the Western world to introduce certain ideas into American agriculture like crop rotation, turning soil, uh, reducing surplus, doing all kinds of things that helped prop up not only the prices of agriculture during the Depression, but made farms more fertile, increase their output. And in fact, his reforms were later incorporated into Latin America. And for a period of time, there had been periodic famines in Latin America. And with Wallace's reforms, probably hundreds of thousands of people were saved from malnutrition or death by famine in Latin America. He was an extraordinary figure in our public life. But he was always a controversial figure because, and this was something I tremendously admired about this figure, he never hid or concealed his occult beliefs. He didn't keep them on the down low. He was fairly public about his interests. And he used to go to Washington dinner parties and he would talk about Buddhism and astrology and he would take out this Tibetan Buddhist amulet that he carried with them and explained to people that he had relieved himself of chronic migraines by rubbing this um, amulet on his forehead. And sometimes he would make people very uncomfortable, including Roosevelt himself. Um, there was one time Roosevelt wrote a memo saying, by God, what's the matter with Wallace? You know, because sometimes he would talk about mystical theories during cabinet meetings and things like that. And Wallace also got involved with a figure whose statue was sculpted by Manley Hall himself, and you can see it in the library, and that was Nicholas Rorick. And Nicholas Rorick was a great Russian artist. There's a small museum in New York City dedicated to Rorick's work uh, today. And Rorick was a visual artist, a set designer, a mystical traveler, and he attracted the attention of a lot of powerful people for a time in the 1930s, and Wallace became one of his students. And for a period of a few years, he was very dedicated to Nicholas Rorick. And in fact, one of Rorick's great works, which still stands in New York City today, and I think it's at the corner of Riverside Drive and West 104th Street, is the Master Building, the Master Building. Today it's called the Master Apartments. It's a magnificent Art Deco residential skyscraper. And Rorick believed that a great teacher from the East, a great adept, was going to emerge on the Western scene and become kind of a world teacher who would usher in a new age of education and spiritual awareness. And his conception was that when this master arrived, he would live on the top floor of the master apartments. And today, this magnificent skyscraper still stands in New York City, and if you put the master apartments into Google, don't do it right now, but do it later when you're home. Um, you can see that today it's a very expensive piece of real estate. It's beautifully decorated. And most of the people who live there and most of the realtors who trapeze through its lobby have no idea what the original purpose of the building was. So in 1934, Wallace made the decision that this symbol, this mysterious symbol of the eye and pyramid, should be brought more to people's attention, should become part of our public life. Because he believed that the idea of this country ushering in kind of a new order of the ages was something that could help lift people's spirits during the Great Depression. He, Wallace himself, used the term New Deal of the ages. He thought that's what the Roosevelt administration was trying to accomplish. Invest people with a sense of dignity and purpose and possibility. Invest 
in the arts, in industry, in agriculture, give people a chance to feel that they can live out their potentials, that they can create that which they wish to create. And Wallace had this idea that some sort of a commemorative coin or piece of currency should be pressed with this beautiful iron pyramid symbol on it. So he brought this to the attention of Roosevelt, who just loved the idea, because as a fellow Freemason, Roosevelt too had a real taste for portentous imagery and symbol. And he felt that symbol could kind of speak to something in the individual, could arouse energies in the individual. And I think this is very true. I'm always reminding people that, and I, I know most of you in this room feel this as well, symbols really are mysterious. I mean, they really have the capacity to summon something within us, even when we don't necessarily know the specific language or etymology behind them. But when you see the pentagram, you pay attention to that. When you see the Star of David, when you see the cross, when you see the all-seeing eye, when you see the obelisk, when you see the pyramid, when you see the skull and crossbones, these things summon up from within an individual uh, a kind of magnetic attention. We're drawn to them. We're drawn to them. And I think that's among the reasons why some of these symbols are so popular today within hip-hop culture, for example. So there are all these rumors that go around that you know, Jay-Z and Naz and even Lady Gaga are part of something called the Illuminati because they're using these symbols during Super, time, you know, Super Bowl halftime shows or what have you. But I think as artists, they really understand and really grok to the fact that these symbols possess power. They summon something from within us. They, they lift our energies. They focus our gaze. Some people make the decision, uh, such as those who enter Order of the Eastern Star or Freemasonry, to study these symbols in earnest. But for others, they're just points of magnetism. And Wallace, I think correctly, had this instinct that this Freemasonic-inspired symbol on the back of our great seal had that kind of energy and should be brought into the public eye. So he brings this idea to Roosevelt and Roosevelt is delighted with the idea and says, I'm going to do you one better. Not only are we going to put it on currency, but we're going to put it on the back of the dollar bill itself. And Roosevelt was so turned on by this idea that he personally supervised the placement of the great seal on the back of our dollar bill. And he did something very unusual. And these records actually exist in the US Treasury Department, and I believe you can find them online as well. He, in his own pencil, in his own writing, working on a set of proofs of the new version of the back of the dollar bill, he rearranged the order of the great seal, uh, of, the, of the reverse of the great seal of the Iron Pyramid with the more familiar American Eagle. So that if you take a look at the back of the dollar bill, you'll see that the if there were like a dollar bill up here in front of us, you'd see that the reverse, the Iron Pyramid, occupies the dominant position, occupies what would be the position from which you start to first gaze at the bill. So it's in the more commanding position. He reversed it in terms of its order from where it originally was. It was originally in a lesser position so that it seemed to come second, so to speak, and he did an actual reversal. So it was the first place the eye was drawn to when you look at the dollar bill. And they decided that this would be the new way, the primary uh, certificate of American currency would look and the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, was entirely disgusted with this whole plan. He later complained in his memoir that Henry Wallace was part of some mystical cabal and he got this crazy idea about the Iron Pyramid on the back of the bill, but Roosevelt was entirely sold on it. And so in 1935, while Wallace was still Secretary of Agriculture, this new redesigned currency was issued. And for the very first time, 
mass numbers of people became familiar with this esoteric symbol that was at the heart of our founding. And one could say, well, is it anything more than just a, a decoration? Is it anything more than just a piece of adornment? Does it really have any esoteric meaning? And I would argue that it does. I would argue that it does. Because not only is the symbol portentous in its own right, not only does the symbol contain within it a whole language that I think speaks to the mythical and the primal within us, but I think it, it captured and it continues to capture the best things about our society, the best things about our society, the things that have to be strengthened, the things that have to be tended to, the things that have to be watched over constantly. And that is, again, this notion of the birthright of the individual spiritual search, that which belongs ineffably to all of us. And the nation in its earliest days, even going back to the colonial period, was known as a safe harbor for people with radical religious ideas. And it's contradictory, as so much in American history is contradictory, because during the colonial period and well beyond, you had the horror of slavery, which obviously went on and on deep into the 19th century, compounded by decades of Jim Crow and injustice after that, continuing to the present day. And you also had the destruction of the Native American culture. So you have these two mass bloody crimes going on, but concurrent with that, you do have the colonies developing very early on a reputation as a safe harbor for people with radical religious beliefs. And as it happened back in Europe, there was brewing beginning in the early 1600s, just as the American colonies were taking shape, there was a tremendous backlash against some of the religious reforms and occult experimentation that occurred during the Renaissance, especially after the death of Queen Elizabeth. Because in England, Queen Elizabeth was a kind of protector of people with occult interests. She had her own court astrologer, John Dee, who was later sort of disgraced and forced into exile after her death, and she was replaced by King James. And you also had, uh, within the German-speaking region of Central Europe, the outbreak of a war in 1618 that became known as the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War had many different causes. There were many different reasons for its outbreak. But essentially, it pitted Catholic armies against Protestant armies, and it grew in part out of a backlash against the relative religious liberalism and experimentation that had previously played out during the Renaissance. This area of Central Europe, this German-speaking area, which was more or less bookended by the Rhine River in the west and the Republic of Bohemia in the east, that was the springboard for so much occult and spiritual experimentation in Europe. People were practicing alchemy and number mysticism and prophecy and divination and a whole range of beliefs that were considered uh, verboten in other parts of the continent. And as a result of the Thirty Years' War, that very experimental region of Central Europe was just decimated for generations. And as it happened, a number of the religious experimenters who dwelt there crossed the Atlantic and took up residency in the American colonies. One of the things you can read about in The Secret History of America, and I write about this as well in my book, Occult America, there was a mystical monk named Johannes Kelpius in Central Europe, and he existed sort of on the far fringes of the Lutheran church, and he took a band of maybe about 40 followers out of Central Europe into England. They made the journey across the sea 
uh, and resettled in Philadelphia. And they settled in the summer of 1694. Again, this is 100 years before the framing of the Constitution, roughly. They settled in Philly on the banks of the Wissahickon Creek. And Philadelphia, at that time, was considered a place, even though it was quite small, where people could freely practice their religions and engage in religious experiment. Philadelphia was founded by William Penn, who had been a Quaker, and Penn experienced religious discrimination at Oxford, even though he was part of a very wealthy family, and he was given a huge land grant in the American colonies, founding what became Pennsylvania, and he fulfilled a lifelong dream in creating the city of Philadelphia, which he named as the city of brotherly love. And his idea was that Philly was going to be a place where people could freely practice their religion without molestation or jailing or fear of persecution. And so Kelpius and his little circle, amazingly enough, heard news of this all the way across the Atlantic. They took the journey, they made it, they settled in Philly, and they founded this kind of monastic hermitage on the banks of the Wissahickon Creek in Philadelphia, where they practiced number symbolism, prophecy, divination. They believed that different tones of music could attenuate you to different qualities of the spiritual world. Now, he died about 12 years later from tuberculosis, but nonetheless, his commune was considered a successful social experiment, and other people heard about it and trickled across the Atlantic for actually many, many generations. The Shakers were a religious group that fled persecution in Manchester, England. Their founder, Mother Anne Lee, was a radical Quaker, and people started to call her group the Shaking Quakers. That's where their name came from, because they engaged in seances and things that we would call you know, channeling and mediumship, and they were accused of witchcraft. And Mother Anne rather intriguingly responded to her critics, the only witchcraft is sin. And she led a band of about 12 followers across the Atlantic, settled in New York City in 1775. And they were poor folk, and they had to work very tough domestic jobs, cleaning chamber pots, cleaning chimneys, just to sort of scrape together enough money to survive. And the following year, they had pulled together enough money so that they were able to relocate up the Hudson River outside the city of Albany in a little village called Niskayuna. That was the Native American name. And they founded up there the very first Shaker village. And that, too, was seen as a successful commune. And Shaker villages began to appear in other parts of the country, as far north as Maine and as far south as Kentucky. And actually, some of the Shaker villages settled that particular swath of the country. And it's interesting, if you, if you go up to, to the village of Niskayuna today, today it's called Watervliet. The name has changed to a Dutch name. But if you go up to the, to the, to the Shaker site at Niskayuna today, some of the original buildings are still there, and Mother Anne's grave is there, a very, very plain gravestone just marked Mother Ann Lee, and I visited that spot. And it's interesting, you have to get your hands dirty when you're researching this stuff, because it's so interesting to go up there and see that this spot of land that the Shakers occupied, it's a really terrible, terrible spot of land. It's basically like a swamp. It freezes over in the winter. It's not very fertile. It's rocky. It's rooty. It's knotty. In the summer, when things thaw out, it reverts to being a swamp, and it's mosquito-infested. And it's almost unbelievable to think that this really very poor group of people who had migrated to escape charges of witchcraft in Manchester were able to relocate relatively safely uh, in upstate New York. And they were absolutely wild. The Shakers, today, if you ask people about the Shakers, 
they usually know two things. They were celibate and they made nice furniture. And that's all that, that's all that school kids get told. But the fact is, the Shakers were real mystics. They would engage in things that we today would call seances and medium trances and they would get inhabited by spirits and speak in tongues and go into ecstatic dances. And the paintings that they created, the murals that they created, the works of music that they created, they referred to as spirit gifts. And they said that they had been inspired to do these things as gifts from the spirit, gifts from the unseen world. And the Shakers were, in their own way, a very, very radical group. We could do a whole evening just talking about them alone. They did experience harassment. I, I don't want to paint an excessively rosy picture. One night, Mother Anne was seized by a, a mob, and she was disrobed because she was suspected of being a British agent uh, during the Revolutionary War because the Shakers were also pacifists. They would not fight uh, in the military. So, so there was hostility directed against them. And she did put up with a great deal of hardship, and yet she absolutely endured. She absolutely succeeded. And it's extraordinarily moving to go up to Niskayuna today and to see her gravesite, this simple, simple gravestone, just with her name and her birth and death date on it. And this story, there are many such groups, there are many such figures. It repeated again and again through American life because there was a feeling that imbued many parts of the nation or many parts of the colonies that the spiritual search was something that was protected, that was sacred, that was ineffable. Again, it's contradictory because there were all these criminal things going on at the same time, but there was this persistence, there was this kind of golden thread of protection for the spiritual search. And it's funny, I was speaking um, to a reporter today from the French newspaper La Echo, and she wanted to write an article about the popularity of psychics back in New York City, where I'm from, and we were talking and we were having a long and fruitful conversation, but she kept coming back again and again to this point she couldn't understand. Why do people do this? What is this all about? You know, back home in France, everybody thinks this is all a joke. And, you know, I kept trying to kind of explain to her that within the American character, or the best of it, within the best of the American character, there's this impulse that we're not so completely separated from the other world. We don't need an intermediary to guide us to the other world. We don't necessarily need the man in the robes or a minister or a priest or even a medium to tell us what's what. There's a feeling that people have that, of course, everybody has their own commitments and everybody has their own way of viewing things. I can't overly generalize, but I would say that there is an ethic, there is a feeling that the individual has his or her own right to pursue some sense of inner meaning, internal search, uh, some sense of individual agency that says, I am entitled by birthright, entitled by birthright to search for something greater than myself and that this something can be very practical, can be very therapeutic, can respond to my needs in the here and now. And I've had the experience of speaking with people from other nations in the West and in the East who have a great deal of difficulty wrapping their minds around what would seem to be very basic civics in the best iteration of our civics as a public society. Um, my book, One Simple Idea, which is a history of the positive thinking movement, was translated in China, and the young woman who was translating it lived in Shanghai. And she too, I recall, as with this French journalist, had a great deal of difficulty understanding certain basic concepts that to us, I would say, are basic. I remember we were talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, 
and the recovery movement and how one of the central principles of Alcoholics Anonymous is that the individual needs to search for a higher power on his or her own terms, that no one can dictate what this higher power is, that it's up to the individual to engage in his or her own search for whatever it is and whatever personal conception that means to them. And I remember one time there was just dead silence at the other end of the Skype call and her response was basically, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> what is this higher power and, and what are you making reference to? And concepts that are almost in the groundwater, in the groundwater that we drink from can sometimes be very, very difficult for people from other societies to understand. And I think that's a positive thing. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I don't care how much time I have to spend on the phone with the reporter from France or you know, the translator from Shanghai. I never tire, uh, perhaps unsuccessfully, of trying to explain what I'm driving at. It turns out, at the end of the day, when the tr translation of my book came out, the Chinese government censored about 30% of it. They cut out about 30% of it. So. Apparently, I wasn't entirely persuasive to the censors, but I think that, that these concepts do represent something that is truly special and powerful about the best of American life, the best of American life. And this was something that Manley Hall understood when a lot of historians didn't, or a lot of historians would have been incapable of putting their finger on it. To most historians, Freemasonry, for example, would be nothing more than a glamorous footnote in American life. But Manley took very, very seriously how central this commitment was to some of the founders. And it is true that some of the major founders in the country were Freemasons. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, John Hancock, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, the French hero of the uh, Revolutionary War. He got it. He was a French person who got it. So, um, but um, it really was an extraordinary list, and and a very large subset of Washington's generals, of the signers of the Declaration, of the framers of the Constitution, were Masons. And I think that that's important, and that that's that's unique, and that's meaningful. And Manley grasped this in a way that I think few other historians did. And there are ways in which masonry has played out in American life that are not well understood. Another involves the African-American branch of Freemasonry that today is called Prince Hall Masonry. And there's increasingly close contact, I'm happy to say, between Prince Hall Masonry and the mainstream, the main branch of masonry. Prince Hall Masonry uh, was founded, and it's interesting because these dates were kind of off key for a little while. It used to be thought that Prince Hall Masonry was founded in 1775, but there are two Masonic historians uh, today, uh, Jim Hairston and Oscar Ayane, who are just terrific. And they published a monograph recently that demonstrated with absolute authority that Prince Hall Masonry was founded in 1778 for years the year 1775 had been perpetuated because somebody from the Massachusetts Historical Society, writing contemporaneously to that time, it was just a few years later, miswrote the date, wrote down the date 1775, and this was probably in the late 1700s, and since it seems like a primary source, it was quoted again and again and again, but no one ever bothered to verify or question the date based on the earliest minutes and meeting documents of Prince Hall Masonry, but Jim Hairston and Oscar Ayene have done just yeoman's work historically, and they've demonstrated that Prince Hall actually goes to 1778. The name comes from the founder, the first grandmaster of the lodge, who himself was named Prince Hall. He was a freed man of color, a leather worker who worked in the city of Boston, and he and a group of about 30 brethren uh, got their own charter to start up a Masonic Lodge, which they called African Lodge Number 1. 
and they were the first African-American Freemasonic group here in what at that time was still the American colonies. And it's very interesting. Prince Hall's name, Prince Hall's name appears on two of the first petitions against slavery in American life. One petition is from 1777, and the other petition is from 1778. So one of the things I try to explain to people about Masonic history in America, and I want to make this point very, very carefully, it's not that abolitionism directly came from Freemasonry. There were many, many factors free, feeding into the cause of abolitionism. But, but, in effect, in effect, Prince Hall Masonry was the first black-led abolitionist movement in American life. The first black-led abolitionist movement in American life. Because when you crack open to people the idea that the spiritual search is their absolute birthright, you cannot close that door. You cannot close that door. Everything else starts to come in along with it. And the primacy of the individual as a matter of course flows from and follows from that. And that's why a lot of instances where you will find an upswing in a cult or supernatural or radically ecumenical activity coincide directly with political reforms. Because as soon as the individual begins to identify him or herself as relating to higher forces, as possessing the ability to expand beyond the given, it's impossible for that person to ever see him or herself as open to subjugation again. They might not be able to physically escape subjugation, but internally, internally, it becomes impossible to kind of keep that person in his or her place. And that's why again and again, you'll find that upsurges of occult activity and radical political reforms are always wed. They're always wed. For example, back in Europe, again in France, there was the occult healer Franz Anton Mesmer who arrived in Paris in 1778. And Mesmer told people that he had discovered this invisible ethereal fluid that animated all of life, which he referred to as animal magnetism. That's where the term comes from. And Mesmer's theory was that if he could put you into a kind of a trance state, he could manipulate your animal magnetism and cure mental illness or physical illness or any kind of maladies that you were experiencing. And here it was a few years before the French Revolution, and Mesmer began to amass quite a following. And some of his followers were political. Some of his followers were political radicals because they were very turned on, and listen to this very carefully, they were very turned on by the idea that if you could identify this ethereal fluid that animated all of life, it followed from that that all individuals, regardless of bloodline, were essentially equal, were essentially the same. And it was not lost on people, because at that time in France, at the dawn of the revolutionary era, at that time, everything was sort of cast into a political light. And it was not lost on people that if a commoner and an aristocrat, or if a slave and a plantation holder in the West Indies could each be placed into this kind of mesmeric trance, revealing these hidden energies that coursed through each individual, it was unavoidable to reach the conclusion of human equality. It was absolutely unavoidable. And this was very understood by people who were political radicals at the time on the French scene. And for that reason, Mesmer was held in great suspicion by King Louis XVI, and he disliked Mesmer very deeply because there were these rumblings that this man had discovered this occult or internal principle of life, and it completely struck at the foundations of the entire caste system. So King Louis decided to convene a royal commission to investigate Mesmer, and this commission, 
was chaired by Benjamin Franklin, who at the time was the American ambassador to France. And they issued their report. And they said, well, you know, they had experimented with Mesmer's methods among different patients. And they found that there were some physical manifestations that grew out of mesmeric trances, some isolated cases of healings, but they all seemed to be, in the commission's words, in the imagination. And they stopped short right there. They stopped short right there on the precipice of their most significant question, which is, if it's all in the imagination, then why should anything be happening at all? Why are there physical effects manifested from the imagination? And what is this thing we call imagination anyway? They just didn't probe any further, and they left their most tantalizing question open and unresponded to. But undeterred was the Marquis de Lafayette, who actually became a student of Mesmer's and became an apprentice to Mesmer. And after the Revolutionary War, in 1784, into Washington's second term, Lafayette decided that he was going to take a trip to America because he was specifically interested in some of the supernatural manifestations that were going on among the Shakers. And he wondered if their trance states and their seances coincided with the things that were happening while people were under mesmeric trances. And I came across a quote that I worked very, very hard to track down where Lafayette appeared in the court of King Louis XVI and uh, he let him know he was going to be taking this trip to America to visit his friend George Washington. He didn't disclose to him that he was also going to be visiting Shaker villages so that he could research mesmerism. And King Louis teased him and said, oh, what will your best friend General Washington do when he discovers that you're an apprentice of this sorcerer, Mesmer. And I came upon this in this journal of German-American history from the 1940s, and I thought, where did this quote come from? And I researched it and researched it, and I found eventually that there was this multi-volume history of court life in France that was published by one of King Louis' courtiers who had survived the revolution. It was written in French across about 12 volumes. I get very hyper about these things. And, um, and there, there was the quote. There was the quote. He had overheard it or claimed to, and he repeated it. And so here is, is King Louis teasing the Marquis de Lafayette saying, what is your best friend General Washington going to think when he finds out you're a sorcerer's apprentice? As it turns out, Washington already knew, and he didn't care because there was, was actually, and this is in the Library of Congress, there was actually correspondence between Washington and this occult healer, Mesmer. Mesmer uh, wanted to found a network of schools, and he called them the Society for Universal Philosophy, and he wanted to open some of these schools in the New Republic of America, and he wrote to Washington to ask him for his permission to do this, and Washington wrote back, in effect, saying, you don't need to necessarily ask my permission. You're perfectly welcome to do this if you want. The Marquis de Lafayette has described your theories to me, and if any of this happens to be true, then certainly this will redound back to you as one of the great intellects of our age. Washington always gave himself an out. You know, He was very diplomatic. It's like, well, I have no idea whether you're a charlatan, but if it's true, it sounds great. Um, and this obviously never happened. We don't have these, these academies of universal philosophy spread across the United States, but it was interesting that a figure who was regarded as very verboten and very occult in Europe actually had correspondence with George Washington. And I think the fact that Washington had a background as a Freemason made things like this possible, made things like this possible. And there are other episodes in Washington's career and that in the career of other founders where at surprising moments, they would appear very, very religiously and spiritually open. And it was quite remarkable. And I think it's easy to underestimate the depth of commitment that Freemasonry represented for people at that time. Because back in the day, just after the War of Independence, the United States was a hugely rural agricultural place. There were 
very few universities, hospitals, libraries, everything was more or less in private hands. The only institutions really were agriculture, church, commerce. You wouldn't really have contact with people outside of those pillars of life. So to join a fraternal order, much less an esoteric fraternal order, was a huge commitment. It opened a person up to a whole group of networks and contacts that he never would have found uh, in church and farm life. And I think it's been difficult for some historians to understand the true depth of that commitment today and what it meant and how it made it easier for people like Washington and Lafayette to consort with and to be relatively open to the ideas of a figure like Mesmer. So when Manley Hall wrote that secret societies, masonry in particular, kind of vouchsafed a set of ideals that took birth in the New Republic and that created a, an atmosphere in which people could freely engage in the spiritual search, I think his instinct was absolutely right. I think it was vitally, vitally correct. And I think while there were different forces and factors and complexities that contributed to this, and while that not every founding voice was involved with Freemasonry, particularly you know, Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, there was a very, very clear and pronounced influence that it's very, very easy to miss if you don't know where to look. And Manley Hall really, truly knew where to look. And knowing where to look is a vital aspect of discovering the occult components of our own history. One of the things that I write about in the introduction to The Secret Destiny of America is the relationship between Manly P. Hall and Ronald Reagan, which is quite extraordinary and which hasn't been really covered and written about much before. And I originally came to it in the year 2010. I had been on a radio show in New Orleans, and after the show, the host said to me, hey, did you know that Reagan believed in this whole concept of hidden spiritual masters? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And he sent me uh, a newsletter from a right-wing congressman, which reprinted a little essay that Reagan wrote on the meaning of the 4th of July. And I later tracked this essay down to a July 4th, 1981 issue of Parade magazine, which had approached Reagan early in his first term and asked him to write a personal essay on what the 4th of July meant to him. And actually, Reagan had written this essay in longhand on a yellow legal pad at Camp David and then submitted it, as asked, to Parade magazine. And as I was reading this essay, I was absolutely shocked because I started to recognize certain ideas and language and phraseology that came directly from the writings of Manley P. Hall. And I was completely blown away. And in this little essay of his, Reagan tells a story that appeared in the work of Manley P. Hall in its earliest form in Secret Teachings of All Ages and later repeated in Secret Destiny of America, in which Manley tells the story of there being this mysterious speaker at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and that at Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the delegates were debating over whether to sign the Declaration. And they were very conflicted over this, because they thought, well, if we go to war with the Crown and we lose, anybody's name who's on this document is going to be hanged. So they were kind of wavering. And the story that Manley tells is that this mysterious man suddenly rose from the galley and nobody knew how he had gotten into the locked room past the armed sentries and he gave this rousing address that told everyone if you sign this document you're going to be performing one of the great acts of human liberty in history. And he spoke with such appeal and in such a magnetic way that the wavering delegates at the end of his speech all rose to their feet and rushed forward to sign the document. And then after the ruckus had died down, they 
looked to thank or congratulate the unknown speaker, and he had vanished from the locked room, and no one knew where he came from. And Manley asked, was this a member of the secret order who had sent one of their emissaries to buck up the spirits of the wa wavering delegates? And Reagan, who had a taste for mythology, was very turned on by this story, and I discovered that he had been retelling this story in speeches going back to his earliest political career when he was a spokesman for General Electric. And he continued to tell it up through his presidency, including a televised speech that he gave for the centenary of the Statue of Liberty, which was broadcast literally to millions of people. And I'm going through these documents, and dead to rights, dead to rights, there is the phraseology of Manly P. Hall actual phrases and terms that Manley used, specifically going back to the secret destiny of America. And the earliest passage from Secret Destiny is, is reprinted in this anthology. And it's inescapable to conclude that Reagan had read this book. And I began to research and to look into it and found that not only had Reagan retold this story repeatedly over the years, but our dear friend, Dr. Stephen Heller, who I think will be here tomorrow night, but he's speaking tonight at the Besant Lodge, so he couldn't be here. But Stephen shared with me a very valuable story, which appears in the introduction to the secret history of America. Stephen was a fixture here on this campus in the early 1970s. And one day there was a big black stretch limousine parked outside of Manley Hall's office, and there was a uniformed chauffeur having a smoke outside the limousine, and a couple of state police um, just kind of mingling around the campus. And Stefan looked at this and he wondered, and he told me that he went up to the driver and he said, uh, to who belongs this uh, beautiful car? And the driver at first sort of hemmed and hawed, and then later said to him, well, it belongs to Governor Reagan. He's in meeting with Mr. Hall. And the next day, Stefan repeated this to a woman named Pearl Thomas, who at the time was the librarian and a good friend of Manley's. And she said, oh, yes, yes, uh, the two of them are friends. He's visited several times, but we're not supposed to talk about this. And Stefan said that later on, when Reagan began to rise to national political prominence, some of the uh, gang here on campus might be sitting around watching the news on television, and when Reagan would come on, Manley would chuckle and say, oh, yes, yes, we know him. And anyone who knows Stephen Heller knows that he is not a man given to hyperbole or exaggeration, so I take his testimony very seriously. And it matches up almost exactly with the timeline of some of Reagan's telling of this story, because um, one of the figures to whom Manley had attributed this story was Thomas Jefferson. And Roughly contemporaneous with the time that uh, Stefan said Reagan was here on campus, Reagan gave a speech uh, to CPAC in Washington. This was in 1974. And he again repeated the story of the mysterious speaker. And he said, this story was told to me by a man who's an avid history, an avid student of American history. And he attributed the story to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but I confess I never made the effort to research it or check it out. Manley was the only person who ever attributed the story of the unknown speaker to Thomas Jefferson. Different versions of this story have bopped around over the years, and I found what I believe is the inceptive version, which I'll tell you about, but Manley was the only one who ever attributed the story to Thomas Jefferson. The earliest point where the story occurred actually was in 1845. It was in a book called Legends of the Revolution, written by a journalist named George Lippard, who was friends with Edgar Allan Poe. And Lippard basically conceded that the story was legend, that it didn't really happen. But he felt that it did capture some of the more idealistic oration of the day. But Manley did take the story as solid fact. He repeated it, others repeated it, and eventually Reagan repeated it. There is a manner in which myth exposes us to our highest ideals. Myth exposes us to who we really are inside. 
And Gerald Ford made the interesting observation that Ronald Reagan was one of the few people he ever met whose public statements revealed more about the private man than did any intimate conversation. He felt Reagan was more disclosing in public than he was in intimate settings. So the fact that Reagan grokked to this story and got this story from the pages of an occult and esoteric philosopher named Manly P. Hall, I found quite remarkable. And it's a demonstration of how deeply some of these ideals can find their way into our public life out of view, out of view. Those of you who sat here for tarot readings sat with me in Manley's office, maybe in the same chairs that he and Ronald Reagan were seated in. That may give you mixed feelings. I have no idea. But it was an interesting facet of history. And one of the other facets of history, and there are many, there are many, that I think Manley touches upon in the writings and secret history of America. And I think this is a very, very important quality in our public life. And this sort of goes back to what I was having difficulty explaining earlier to the reporter from France and the translator in Shanghai, is the idea that reaching into the unseen, reaching for the ineffable, is not something that just belongs to or is the property of ancient prophets or people wearing vestments, but it is the property and the birthright of every individual. And I think in the best of our public life, in the best of our public life, not only is that something that we feel, but it's one of the reasons why alternative spiritual movements have flourished in America, have endured in America, and have often caught on very, very quickly. One of the figures that Manley writes about in the book was a very influential spirit medium from the 19th century named Andrew Jackson Davis. And I think a lot of you, in a certain sense, will be able to see your own search mirrored in the life and the story of Andrew Jackson Davis. This was a poor farm boy who grew up in upstate New York on the Hudson River outside the city of Poughkeepsie in the 1830s, 1840s. And he grew up in a very poor, very hard scrabble family that had a reputation, as did Joseph Smith's family, roughly contemporaneously, that had a reputation for clairvoyance, second sight, prophetic dreams, an interest in the occult. And Andrew, at a young age, at the age of about 17, got very interested in mesmerism, the work of Franz Anton Mesmer, the occult healer from Paris. And there was a, a circuit-riding mesmerist who came to town, and he would hypnotize people on stage so that they might do things like cluck like chickens or pretend they were flying, and it was really just a carnival show. And he called Andrew up on stage, and he wasn't really able to put Andrew under into a, a mesmeric trance, or what we today would call a hypnotic trance. But days later, there was a local tailor in town who told Andrew that he too had been experimenting with mesmerism and would Andrew like to uh, try again. And again, look at, the, look at the lives, look at the background that these folk come from. Uh, a circuit riding mesmerist, uh, a kid who grows up on a poor farm in upstate New York, uh, a local tailor, and they're experimenting with mesmerism, not with anybody's permission. You know, earlier Greg was referencing the fact that Manly P. Hall, in a certain sense, was this uncredentialed guy, and that's true. He had very little formal schooling. He never went to college. In fact, most of the people I, I most deeply respect have never been to college. And there was this sense that permission wasn't required from anyone. A certificate wasn't required from anyone to pursue one's own experiments. And you can see that in the life of Andrew Jackson Davis. And so Davis consented to this local tailor that he could experiment on him, see if he can put him under into a trance. And this time, not only did it work, but Andrew entered a trance that was very deep, that was very profound, and he emerged from the trance, and he gave, at the age of 17, these sprawling epic metaphysical lectures in which he talked about 
principles of life from other dimensions, beings in the afterlife, life on other planets. And he laid out this whole cosmology, even though he was this poor kid who was working at the time as a cobbler's apprentice. And eventually, Andrew became known as a very noted spirit medium who can emerge from these mesmeric trances and deliver these extraordinary cosmic discourses. And the press began to jokingly refer to him as the Poughkeepsie Seer. But rather than rejecting this nickname, Andrew liked it and he instinctively embraced it. And he started to become nationally famous. He moved to New York City in 1845 where he delivered these trance-based lectures, and people attended his lectures, including the short story writer Edgar Allan Poe, who at the time was writing a lot of stories based on the theme of mesmerism. And Andrew attracted a very important and prominent defender, a metaphysical minister by the name of George W. Bush, who was a first cousin, four times removed, from the Bush presidential family. And George W. Bush, at the time, was a very controversial figure because he had been a minister in the Presbyterian Church. He was a Bible scholar. He left the Presbyterian pulpit and joined the Swedenborgian faith, which was a, uh, a faith that was derived from the mystical writings of the Swedish mystic and scientist Emanuel Swedenborg. And Bush wrote a book called Mesmer and Swedenborg, in which he devoted a very, very substantial chapter to defending the visions of Andrew Jackson Davis. And Bush became one of his big supporters, and it was considered absolutely scandalous that this prominent minister and Bible scholar was defending the spiritual visions of this spirit medium from upstate New York. And Andrew, in his writings, which were voluminous, went on to put out a four-volume book of spiritual philosophy in 1854, and in volume four of this book, he coined the term law of attraction. That's where that term came from in its earliest iteration. It didn't mean a law of acquisitiveness. It meant rather that people who were seated around the seance table would attract spirits that had the same nature and qualities in the afterlife that the seekers around the seance table had in this life. But as time passed, law of attraction came to be seen as a kind of mental law of cause and effect. This probably started to take hold about 40 years later while Andrew was still alive. He lived until 1910. And I wrote an article, which is at medium.com, called The Man Who Discovered the Law of Attraction. And in that article, I include a photograph of the metaphysical minister, George W. Bush, and the president, George W. Bush, side by side. And they are the absolute spitting image of one another. It's absolutely uncanny. But George W. Bush is not returning my letters. So I don't know if you will hear further about this. But those were the roots of the Bush family in America. Now, I think the reason why Andrew Jackson Davis, whose name is largely forgotten today, but the law of attraction certainly is not forgotten. I think the reason why a figure like Andrew Jackson Davis and other figures, some of whom I've mentioned, some of whom are, are, are part of history and you can read about them in, in Occult America, you can read about them in Secret History of America. Some of these alternative spiritual figures, these outsider spiritual figures, were able to attain fame and popularity and influence because they came from the environs of everyday life. And I think that they affirmed the best instincts in the American public that there is no certification, no permission, no bloodline, no approbation, no anointment required by anyone, by anyone, to pursue your own sense of personal inner meaning. And we are obviously going through a profoundly angry and divisive time in our history. And although many generations 
like to believe that they live on some sort of historical precipice or that it's just degrees away from the boiling point, I can honestly say in my life I have never seen a time in our country's history where people seem angrier, where people seem more divided, where people seem less possessed of confidence in our having a common future together. And it is easy and it is reasonable to feel profoundly, profoundly concerned about that. But the one thing that may be our saving grace is that I think that the question of whether our society is still functioning, the question of whether we are still functioning as a national community rests upon, rests upon whether there remains protection for the individual search for meaning. And I do believe that despite everything else that's critical and that's profoundly, profoundly disturbing and concerning in our society today, I do believe that pillar has remained untouched. There is tremendous religious diversity within our military, for example. There is tremendous religious diversity across the country. People are responding to survey after survey after survey, identifying non-affiliated as the largest growing category of religious identification in America. So while more and more Americans are referring to themselves as non-affiliated, there hasn't been any decline and quite the opposite in the hunger, the wish for spiritual understanding. There has never been, I think, a greater growth or diffusion of different spiritual and esoteric and mystical ideas across American life. And I really do believe in my heart, I, I would never offer you up any kind of false optimism, I really do believe in my heart that as long as this sense of an individual search for meaning remains embodied as a pillar, as a foundation of our individual lives, as long as the individual search for meaning remains protected, I think we as a society will make it. We will function. And that deeply felt, deep-seated sense of birthright that we have, each of us, around the individual spiritual search is the greatest legacy of the secret history of America. And I thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.